loud mouth ghetto girl. Loud mouth ghetto. Loud mouth ghetto girl. Loud mouth ghetto girl. We might just get hit with the Rico. That's how they get on my people. They take somebody like Huey and they make them seem like Nino. Speaking the truth could be lethal. Too much profit in being deceitful. Sebi was selling the cure, so they gave his ass the placebo. Hello, Mr. John Connor. What's up? Um, you are now in the hot seat on the Loudmouth Ghetto Girl podcast. Okay. Let's say A for hey. all the Loudmouth Ghetto Girls. Let me get one of them about you. Hey, I don't <laughs> that, know if I did it right. That was not a, like Loudmouth Ghetto Girl. But hey. I don't know if I'm going to distort the mic if I get as loud as I want you to. You got to do the hand with like, hey. Don't do the hand. I'm definitely not doing the hand. You look, you look way better doing the hand than I would. See? <laughs> Hey, if he right. do the hand, we real stern. Nah, we not. <laughs> they gonna be like, did y'all see? No, no. Hey. Nah. But, uh, <laughs> where have you do that letter? Um. <laughs> so it is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful to be able to get this interview about you. How you feeling today? I am blessed, highly favored. I'm good. All right. So, um, why don't you give my viewers, listeners, just a quick little bio on you, just in case they've been living under a rock you know, for the last 15 years and they don't know what's going on with you. Okay, I'm John Connor. That's my stage name. A lot of people think that that's my real name. My real name is Jan Freeman. Grew up in Flint, Michigan on the north side. Graduated from Powers Catholic High School. Uh, went to St. John Vianney from eighth grade, um, from pre-K to eighth grade. Um, Man, then after that, just grinded, worked my way on up, doing the underground thing, doing open mics, doing talent shows, doing whatever I could around the city until ultimately um, me and Mateen Cleve started, um, well, we legitimized my first record company, All Varsity hey. Music. Um, and later on, because of my relationship with Mo Cleves and going and doing shows all throughout Michigan, I ended up running into, uh, at the time, he worked at Def Jam. His name is uh, Kendall Youngsad Freeman. He's also, uh, he was the vice president of Maybach Music. Okay. Um, uh, little brother of Fat Man Scoop. I don't know if you want me to put Fat that Man out there, Scoop. but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but just, just to give a little background on um, my record company that I started with Mo Cleves and Young Sav, just to tell y'all who they right. are. But through my grind, I ended up meeting Young Sav. After that, man, it took me to a whole nother level. Um, started making a name for myself within the industry. And that ultimately led to me signing uh, my first record deal with Dr. Dre and Aftermath Entertainment. Um, worked there, produced and wrote there for five years. And now rebranding and restarting a, a new label. And man, that's John Connor, that's me, man. Dope, dope. I remember the first time um, I think we crossed paths was at the U of M in the Kiva at some sort okay. of event that I think we both might have been performing at or something, you know, something like uh -huh. that. And um, I was just really taken aback because at the time, you know, you were young in my, you know, in my eyes, you might have been like maybe like 19, 20 ish, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like super young, but like your content and um, just the way you carried yourself all the time has always seemed real mature like has that always been kind of your um personality or is that something you grew into or was that kind of like your when i'm out in public this my game face this what i'm putting on and then i you know relax a little bit when i'm when well, I'm in for the one, I want to thank you for that compliment to say that I was mature back then. I really appreciate that. I think that that kind of always was how I've been since I was a kid. Like when I was really little, teachers would call my mother and say, well, Jan's not talking. It wasn't so much that I didn't want to talk. It's just that I didn't have nothing to say. I've never been the type to like waste my words or engage in things engage in pleasure for pleasure's sake like right. you know what i'm saying there has to be a reason for what i'm doing what i'm speaking or why i'm moving the way i'm moving so i think that just naturally you know that's how my mother raised me that's how my father raised me my grandfather was a stand-up dude like that mm -hmm. like it was always you know don't just be in no mess just to be in no mess you know think about every move that you make so i feel like that i've always been that you know i'm not um just the total I don't know, in my shell person. I think that when I'm in environments that I'm comfortable, you know, I know how to have fun and let loose. But I definitely have always been the type of person to uh, 
to read the environment right. and to understand what energies I'm around before I just, you know, let it all out. You know what I'm saying? Um, do you think that that advice, um, you know, without being able to say it verb verbatim, like don't get into no mess without getting to no, <laughs> into no mess, do you think that that has been something that has um, helped you throughout this journey in the music industry? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because even tying in your last question to this, it was, I always understood that music is fun, but it's also a job. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, anything can turn into mess if you're not careful. And especially music, because what we do is grounded and rooted in fun. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So the job itself is grounded in fun. So it's easy to slip or go down a slippery slope of that black hole. You know what I'm saying? Right. Of, oh, we wilding, we having fun, we drinking, we this and that. So at a very early age, I established that my job is fun, but it is a job. I can have fun within this job, you know what I'm saying? But it is still a job. So I think that it did help me a lot because, uh, I'm sorry for that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that the way my mother and my father and my grandfather and grandmother raised me as far as like um, not getting in no mess, it definitely helped me out a lot because this business, offers uh your vices are very accessible right you know what i'm saying and they're in abundance mm -hmm. so if you don't know who you are and if you don't know that you're there to work then you you definitely are going to slide down that slippery slope and that's something i never wanted to do i understand that totally yeah <laughs> um so with coming from you know being an artist coming from flint a lot of times we get pigeonholed. You know, mm -hmm. people expect us to, I guess, quote unquote, sound like Flint artists or, you know, sound like Detroit artists. Um, and that's another thing that stood out that I appreciated about you when I first heard you. You didn't sound like, I guess, Flint artists and mm -hmm. you didn't sound like Detroit. I couldn't just say, oh, he's from Michigan or, oh, he's from, you know, it wasn't a, a East Coast. Flint. It was just you. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't like I could be like, oh, he sounds like this or he sounds like that. Um being from Flint and not necessarily sounding like a Flint artist, does did that make it harder to kind of get on the scene in Flint? Yeah, in the beginning it was kind of in the beginning it was kind of rough because I think that um, I think that's with anything. You know, it's funny because even before this we was talking about like sports and comparing like LeBron and Jordan and things mm -hmm. like that. I think that everything, music included, has different eras. And people get happy and comfortable, and they get they they get stuck on what they're used to. So right. the new guard of any type of thing is always met with resistance. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So when I was coming up, um, I've always been a believer in individualism as an indiv as a person and as an artist. Yeah. Like you know, I'm gonna do what I want to do regardless of what the majority thinks. And by doing me, there'll be an audience or a fan base of people that'll gravitate to that. I'm not going to change what I do or who I am to fit something that's a mold that's already there. I always said to myself, I don't want to be the next nobody. I want to be the first John Connor. And if that comes with resistance, if that comes with people not understanding, that was cool with me. But I understood what it was is, you know, like I said, people in my generation, I'll just use basketball as an example. Mm -hmm. We love Jordan. But yeah. the generation before that loved Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. And then the generation before that, like, you know, it, it's like every generation has their guy or their, in music, their sound that they fell in love with, right? Mm -hmm. So I understand. And I, if you go back and look at every interview I ever did, I always paid tribute to Ready for the World, MCV, MC Breed, Top Authority, Dayton Family, every interview because I understand that if there was no them there would be no me there would be no door to even come through if they hadn't existed right you know I just always looked at it as you know what this is my take on music this is my take on what I uh, uh, on hip-hop and through me staying committed to me being me my sound ultimately became a part of Flint's sound. It became a part yeah. of Flint's heritage. You know what I'm saying? Instead of building on blocks that had already been established, I wanted to show the world that we not just one thing. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, and I always look forward to other artists that don't sound like me. 
to come up. You know what I'm saying? Because then that just add to and show the world more colors of this whole like uh, uh, painting that is Flint, Michigan. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And I, I don't want to get too long winded on that subject, but if you look at every city, like um, in New York, um, Jay Z doesn't sound like Cameron. Right. Um, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Cameron doesn't sound like Talib Kweli. Talib mm -hmm. Kweli does. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. In Chicago, Common doesn't sound like Kanye West. Kanye West doesn't sound like Twister. Twister don't sound like. You feel me? Yeah. So it's like, why in Flint do we believe that every artist that comes out of our city has to sound the same for us to accept them? Exactly. I think that what I did when I came out with the music that I was coming out with. I feel like I made another generation, the generation after me, comfortable with making the music that they make. And now I listen to younger Flint artists and I'm proud and I'm happy that now there's such a, a level of diversity within Flint artists and I'm not saying that I solely 100% caused that. I would just like to think that I was a part of helping that evolution. You were definitely a part of that, that movement and I think um, at that time, you know, we had like, we had like some really dope spoken word artists. We had, you know, some some really dope quote unquote conscious artists, mm -hmm. you know, around that time too to kind of balance out um, what is traditionally known as, as Flint music, which is like you know more gangster type music, you know, more more street, um, and it, it 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 has a certain cadence. And I think that that kind of like broke that up and gave people, like you said, the younger artists may not necessarily sound like you. But they sound like them. them and they're okay with sounding like them Absolutely. whether them is street whether them is alternative right. where you know right. whatever they are they're they're good with that and and like you said um just going ahead and being comfortable in your own skin i think that gives people an example and helps them to be comfortable absolutely so this next question is a two-part question okay so um i have a lot of friends um who are hip-hop purists mm -hmm and who basically anything made after like 2001 they not fooling with it they are like and even when you get like 2001 ish they like nah bro i'm not you know um and so they're really like you know hip-hop purists and they really stuck on that and um what made you fall in love with hip-hop the truthful answer to what made me fall in love with hip-hop <laughs> <laughs> Straight up <laughs> is Master P. Hey. There was no limit. No limit. And you got to think about when I was a child, yeah. the era that I was a kid in. You know what? Like, this is so crazy. And I, like I say, I'll try not to get long winded with these answers, but we talking about hip hop and I yeah, love talking about hip hop, right? But yeah, hip hop was always in my house, right? Mm -hmm. Like, my older sister was listening to Tupac. She was listening to, uh, of course, that was the era of like death row the 90s yeah. you know what i'm saying she was who else? she was listening there was a detroit artist named boss i don't know if you remember right yeah like i grew up listening and i i was um i was aware that this music was dope you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. but like i grew up just being around all type of music in general because my father uh, played in a lot of bands because he's a musician. He played a guitar, right? Okay. So I didn't initially gravitate toward hip hop. I gravitated toward like soul. I gravitated Me toward too. honestly. <laughs> I, I gravitated toward house and techno music. I gravitated toward movie scores. Like mm -hmm. I would love watching movies because I would get hooked on the music in the movie. Like even I watched WWE. The music was a big part of why I watched that. Right. You know what I'm saying? So my musical influence was a lot of other things, but it was something about like it was 1997 you know what i'm saying and i'll never forget it it was the tru cd with the three skulls on <laughs> true to the game you don't want it right <laughs> Go the right. With a sound. right <laughs> man my man dave from down the street came and played that album for me and from that point on it was on mm -hmm. it was like i don't know i i really to this day not and not discrediting them in any way because the music was dope i'm just yeah. saying like i don't know for me it wasn't a lot of the cliche things that people say inspired them to get into hip hop. For me, it was Master P, it was TRU. It was the first time I heard No Limit Soldiers and it was on. Like after that, I told my mama, I'm gonna be a rapper. And That's from dope. that point on, it was on. That's dope. Um, and it's so, it's so great to hear that because you know, hip hop is, is so young. You know what I'm saying? Hip hop is a young art form. Um, 
But as it's getting older, the reasons and the influences of what bring people into hip hop get to change too. Like when I'm talking to my oldest son, I remember like I looked in his baby book. I, you know, I would put headphones on my stomach and let him listen to Mozart because they say that's good for, you know, mathematics and things like that. But I will also play Jay-Z. I will also play Biggie. I will also, you know, he's a producer now. My son is. And in my head, I'm thinking like, I wonder how much of that comes from the fact that I used to play this hip hop music. You know what I'm saying? Like when he was in the womb to the fact where when he was like one, he would sit there beat on the tables. And if you move the table, he'd do it on his head. Like he was, you know, mm. pounding out the beat in his head. And it's just... It's amazing to see that, you know, some people got into hip-hop because, and I can't even imagine it, this just seems so surreal to me, like they was in their hood and people was just ciphering. You know what I'm saying? Like those mm-hmm. those people in the early days of hip-hop, that's how they were introduced to it. So we get introduced in these different ways. Like me, my dad was into it. So my first, I remember one Christmas, he bought me like Salt with a Deadly Pepper mm. and uh, Fresh Prince, uh, Parents Just, Parents don't, just understand. don't Understand, the albums. Like, he bought me these two albums, mm. and I don't think he had listened to them because when I got to listen to the song with the Deadly Pepper, I was like, oh, I'm like seven. Like, right, right. <laughs> but um, I think that that's when I fell in love with hip-hop. I was like, you know, like, that's what I want. In my, mm. Like, the fun they having, like, that's what I want. And I just loved words. So um, I just love to hear, you know, the reasons why people fell in love with this art form. And as you was telling your story about what made you fall in love with hip-hop, it was, it, I was uh, thinking back to me listening to the Master PCDs. And when you gave the, uh, the re- like, when you saying Salt with a Deadly Pepper and, and the parents just don't understand thing, I think what it is is whatever made us fall in love with it, it was a feeling. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? And what I got out of the Master P thing was even though them dudes probably won't go down as people's greatest lyricists or whatever the case may be. It showed me that if I believed enough in what I was doing, I could be successful at anything. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? If I if I worked hard enough at something, and if I believe if I believed and the people around me believed in the music I was making, if I was having fun, and if I could create a feeling for people, then I can do anything. And I think that we all that thing of that feeling that gets inside of us. It's a feeling of, you know what? This makes me feel good. This is fun. And if they can do it, they look like me. They around the same age as me. You know what? I can do this too. And I think it's pretty much uh, with hip hop, you realize like that the world is a ghetto. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like that's what hip hop does. No matter if your ghetto is in Oakland and mm-hmm. your ghetto going to sound a little different, but I'm still going to be Absolutely. able to identify with some of the things you saying and some of the, you know, I'm going to identify mm-hmm. with the beats and, you know, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. In Flint, our hood a little different, so it's gonna rep a little different. Mm-hmm. In New York, they burrows is different, so right. you gonna hear the difference in everybody's music, but it's all tied in because it's all ghetto music, and I don't mean ghetto in you know the sense. I mean ghetto in the sense of the word for real. Like this is where people of a of a specific race mm-hmm. uh, live and and eat and breathe, and this is what it sounds like. Absolutely, you know. So like with. With Master P and with some of the artists from um, Louisiana, you get that Zydeco feel. You know, you get mm-hmm. that type of music in there, and that's what the differences is. Mm-hmm. The differences are are the the original music. You Absolutely. know what I'm saying? Like the, the blues and the, the jazz, which are also black music forms. Mm-hmm. You know, and so tying those things in is what makes the hip hop different, and that's why it bothers me. I think so bad when um, when people who are quote unquote hip hop purists mm-hmm. um, want to pigeonhole hip hop until the in these years between you know 1981 to 1999 and it's like that's not the only you know it's some dope music being made right now you know what's funny about that and and what we talking about about when you say hip hop purists and them being upset about things if it's one thing hip hop has always did it's gave a voice and expressed what's wrong with the youth. You better say that. If you go back and you listen to Tupac and Biggie who were 25 and 24 when they died, mm-hmm. go back and listen to their music and you'll hear what us as the youth of that time felt like was wrong. I think hip hop's still doing the same thing today and the purists shouldn't get so caught up on their musical taste that they're not understanding 
that these kids are telling you what's wrong right now with the youth. Yes. Molly's Perker said, Molly's, yep. <laughs> Molly's Perker. Yeah, they telling you exactly what's exactly wrong. Exactly what's wrong. Hip hop is still doing what it always did. Mm -hmm. Telling you what young black youth feels right now. Yep. Now, whether you like the beat, the 808, the this and that, how they're delivering it, to me, that I don't care about that. Like, you know what I'm saying? What I care about is overall there's a voice that's trying to be heard that's telling you in these records what's happening right now. And mm -hmm. I feel like those people that consider themselves purists, instead of becoming music critics, what they should do is become the big homies and big brothers to yes. pull these kids aside and talk to them. It's like... That, to me, is the main thing that should be happening. Okay, you don't like their music, whatever, whatever. But if they're actually living out the things that they're talking about in the music, that means that you should probably pull them aside and talk to them instead of criticizing them for an art form. Because yeah. at the end of the day, they're living a lifestyle that could end up having them dead or in jail. So what's more important? you Your musical taste or their life? And, okay, so what you're saying, that I'm glad you, you touched on that because right now in the state of hip-hop, there is a lot of depression mm -hmm. in music there is a lot of and there was there's always been and I don't think that I think that because at that time I was in the age range so I wasn't really looking at like mm -hmm. Scarface music as you know him being depressed right. until he came out and talked about his right. mental illness I didn't really even put two and two together I sit alone in my four corner yeah, room you know. candles <laughs> like you know what I'm saying so like the music right now has a lot of depression a lot of suicidal stuff you know going on um how do we combat that as artists? Wow, how do you combat the depression that's going on in the youth? It's so, that is such a massive issue because I feel like um, what's depressing this generation is coming at them from so many angles that I don't know that it's one solution. Mm -hmm. If I turn on the TV and the things that I'm seeing on TV are depression, depressing. If I'm seeing, uh, if I'm seeing, uh, if I'm seeing reality shows, I, I yeah. see because I was gonna name names. <laughs> but if, <laughs> if I'm seeing reality shows that ultimately are depressing because they all end up with beef, drama, and chaos, right? Mm -hmm. And then I turn on the music channel and it's beef, drama, and chaos. Then I look at social media and it's beef, drama, and chaos. And then probably in my single parent home yeah. is beef, drama, and chaos. It's like maybe, not to sound cliche, I guess maybe it starts, man, I, 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 that, like I say, it's so massive. But it, I guess maybe it starts within the home. Maybe it starts with us all as people um, just examining our culture and what we choose to champion and celebrate. Because yes. I think the things that we champion and celebrate is a part of what's causing this overall depression. Think about it, man. Oh, boy, this is about to get crazy. <laughs> when we was kids, <laughs> right? We might have been listening to some gangster music, right? Mm -hmm. Okay? But at least when my mom's turned on the radio, it was, as long as you keep your head to the sky, be optimistic. You can win as long as you keep your head to the sky, mm -hmm. right? Now, even if I'm a kid listening to hip hop, <laughs> it's so rare to find even an R&B song that has a positive message. There was, to me, back in our day, there was a balance. Yeah. You had, like, okay, Uncle Luke and this and the go on, shake that, da, da, mm -hmm. right? But then at the same time, you had De La Soul, who Tribe was Car Tribe Quest. Called Quest, right? Yeah. And then you could turn that off, and then you could listen to Tupac. And then even Biggie, as gangster as he was, it was Big Papa, it was and having fun. it was fun. a balance. It was a balance. To me, what's causing this depression and what's causing, like, such a dark tone of music today is there's no balance. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that... The music that exists today, the Molly Percocet, whatever is going on, yeah. like Sip Lean, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Okay, if that's what you do, that's what you do. But where is the balance? Where is the record? So that's what you do all the time. Right. <laughs> this is all the time? Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, there's no balance. You know what and, I mean? And I, I totally agree with that because Biggie, as dark as his music could get to the left, mm -hmm. he also had, like, Juicy. And Absolutely. he had, you know, those type of songs where 
in his CD, you were going to go from some hood stuff to some funny stuff mm-hmm. to some, you know, sexualized stuff to some fun stuff to something encouraging. You were going to have all of that in an album. Mm-hmm. So do you think that the way music is presented now, since people don't really have to make a whole album, you don't have to make a CD, you can just put out singles. Do you think that affects the way projects are put out? Because is it really a project? Is, you know, is anything conceptualized or is it just I'm going to just make songs and put them out for the most part you got people coming out of the hood in a lot of cases I don't even know if they thinking about the effect that the music has on people it's just I'm trying to do this for me get my homies out the hood get my moms out the hood I don't I don't live in wherever the case. I live right. here. So that's all I'm thinking about. And I, I think that, yeah, I think that the overall agenda um to pay people to pay people to make music that caters to our lower vibrational frequencies, like um that keeps winning because they're seeing immediate results. You feel me? Yep. And if you try to talk to a youth about what their music is doing to some, to the hood in Chicago, but they from the hood in Louisiana, they don't have a connection when my mama and grandma is cool off me saying I sip lean and got yeah. tattoos on my face. So you're trying to tell me that the needs of those people outweigh the needs of my mama and my grandma? Mm-hmm. It's a hard debate to have. And I think, you know, because me and my daughter kind of had this conversation the other day. And we were talking about music and the effects of it and, you know, this. And she was like, well, you know, a lot of it I just listen to for entertainment. And, you know, I, I'm pretty sure she can pick her way through stuff. We, we do a lot of talking. But in order to show her how outlandish some of the stuff she listened to is. So we listen to some, you know, some current female artists. I won't name any. Mm-hmm. We listen to some current female artists, and then we listen to some Kim and Was some Foxy. Viruses? No, we ain't listen to that thought. No, I'm just. <laughs> but um, so. Chop, 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 chop. You know what? <laughs> so Fire Sis is sitting right next to me. Hello. She has a feet on me. Um, but I let her listen to some Kim. You know what I'm saying? And some Foxy. And she was sitting there like with her mouth open like this was the worst thing she had ever heard in her life. And I think it was just because it wasn't, you know, her music plays all the time. It's constantly streaming. She mm-hmm. constantly hears so she's gotten desensitized to mm-hmm. it. And then she hear Kim bust out like, I don't want tonight. Mm-hmm. And she like, whoa, like what is this? And all I'm right. like, it's the same thing. Almost can't believe that her mom was listening yeah, to Yeah, and that I knew every word because I rapped every <laughs> word just to make her uncomfortable. <laughs> right, you know? right. And um, I just wanted her to see how her music also can make people uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think at the end of the day, some of that is the purpose of hip hop. Is to make people uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. So, um, as an artist, do you make music because I need to make this music? If I don't make this music, it's going to, you know, play on my sanity because I'm not creating, I'm not getting this out. Or do you make music with an agenda? Is it like, okay, I think this needs to be said right now. I think this needs to be approached right now. We need to deal with this. Is that how, you know, what is your motivation, I guess? I love people. I love everybody. I love human beings. I I think human beings at our best are some of the most beautiful things ever created, Mm -hmm. right? So for me, um, my purpose of making music has always been to try to uplift people, help people, give them a release or give them an escape. To me, it's always personal. Everything I say in my music, I mean it. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to, I don't, I don't say things that I don't mean. And I don't talk about lifestyles that I haven't seen or lived myself. Um, when I go into the studio, it's just probably a result of me living life and having absorbed so many scenarios. Everything I write is based off of either a conversation or something I've went through, or I might have watched TV that day and seen something that disgusted me and I need to talk about it. Like, it's really just, for me, music is just um, expressing, expressing my views on the world as I see it. And hopefully I help people 
that feel like I feel. So it's personal. I say, yeah. Okay. You know, because I've had people that's like, hey, can you write a song about such and such? And I'm like, I probably could. It would probably be a little whack, though. Right. To me. <laughs> right. Y'all might love it. But to me, it's going to be whack because mm-hmm. it's not personal. Like, everything that I make that I like has to be something personal. Like, Absolutely. I'm not an artist, you know, make me a song about the color yellow. I'm going to be right. like, bruh, like, really, that's what right. we're doing? Um, so, you talked about, you know, the fact that... Um, once you got signed, you spent five years out in Cali. Um, tell me about your five years experience, you know, in the quote unquote industry. Man, um, I learned a lot. Mm-hmm. Like I learned a lot. I think that before I went to California and and um, before I went to California, I feel like I was just raw God given talents. Right. Yeah. I feel like when I went to California and was just entrenched and engulfed in the industry, it confirmed a lot of things that I had been doing as right, and then it checked me on a lot of things that I might have been doing as wrong, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think that my five years in California was a learning experience, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm definitely grateful because, like, uh, you know, people consider Dr. Dre one of the greatest of all time to do this music thing. So for five years, I was able to be under that learning tree mm-hmm. like you know what i'm saying of, of of work ethic of man just understanding like as a rapper even as a rapper you your voice is a you an instrument exactly you know what i'm saying it's not just about rhyming words it's like man you can evoke so many emotions when you learn how to fully use your voice so far as that i just love learning i also learned uh you know, this game can get the best of you. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Um, if you don't have your head on your shoulders, if you don't know who you are, if you are a lost individual or still looking to find yourself, I think that you should take the time to do that before you jump head first into the game. Right. Because I feel like the entertainment business, like I say, your vices are available in abundance. Okay. Ace the best. Yeah, Ace Cabana album is uh, entitled Moon Water, and it's because he's a cancer. So that's his moon sign, and it's a water sign. So I think that how I kind of went against the grain of what Flint music was when I was coming up, I feel like that's what Ace is for this generation. So I'm looking forward to it. He got like a real chill, hippie smoker vibe, but also he got something to say. You know what I mean? So also, uh, I'm trying, okay, I'm going around in a circle. We got, can I say this? Okay, we got, you know what I'm uh, we got my man Ricky Calloway who Are is you Ricky Calloway? Mm-hmm. yes. So we got Ricky Calloway <laughs> in here <laughs> as well. Ricky? What up, Ricky Calloway? Ricky, Ricky. And he got on some nice what is them Oxfords? Pretty Ricky is Pretty what they Ricky. call him. <laughs> Ricky Calloway. Okay, yes. Go ahead. Ricky, Ricky. So I'm gonna big you up real quick. Big ups, man. <laughs> Yo, Rick. Ricky Calloway probably uh, has one of the most soulful, powerful voices that. I've ever come across, you know what I'm saying? Okay, time out. Can you hear some acapella real right quick? Right now, right now? Right now. I'm going to put you on the spot <laughs> like that. Can, come here. You could, do he need the mic? Or can you pick him up? Oh, we got a mic right Do you project oh, well? Let's, let's go. Two mics From your diaphragm. Do you push it? Oh, yeah, I can push well, it. Well, come on. Pause. Pause. <laughs> okay. I'm going to pause for you. Oh, th- thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. I'm a Joe fan, so. Yeah. Hey, 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 hey. Let's get it. For my, um. Joe all the dark skin brothers got a be fan of Joe. Joe fan. Uh, <laughs> I'm a fan of Joe. One of my favorite songs is All the Things. I know y'all love that song. Mm-hmm. So um, I seen a little snippet of that. Mm-hmm. Tell me what kind of man would treat his woman so cold. Mm-hmm. Treat you like you're nothing when you're worth more than gold. Mm-hmm. Girl, to me, you're like a diamond. I love the way you shine. Hundred million dollar treasure, I give the world to make it mine. I put a string of pearls right in your hand. Make love on a beach of jet black sand. Outside in the rain, we can do it all night. Go Ricky. Everybody. Go Ricky. <laughs> Go Ricky. <laughs> Go Ricky. Go Ricky. Go Ricky. Go Ricky. Go Ricky. Things a man won't do. 
Hey. I'll do them for you. And you are? Ricky Calloway. Give it up. Hey. Hey. Absolutely. So Ricky Calloway's album's coming. Um, Marie Mills, who I feel like uh, will probably be the the I'll say the female version of Ricky Calloway being is how I feel like her voice has a soul to it uh -huh. um and I'm going around in that circle Jenna Noel who her music is more like folk but also has a hint of soul in it as well and um why do I feel like I'm forgetting somebody Bella Sunshine Ricky Jenna I said Jenna why we ain't just pull the, the, the I was wait, looking, wait, look, I'm trying to wait, think I of the picture. I got it on my, I got, wait, I got it on, I got it, I got it right here. <laughs> I was trying to think okay, of the picture. Okay, yep, John Connor, Bella Sunshine, J, Jada Ali, <laughs> Ace Cabana, like Jenna Noel, Marie Mills, Ricky Calloway. Okay, I said everybody. <laughs> okay, cool. So all of them um, have albums coming out and from top to bottom. And the thing that I love about ABM Music Group is that it's all Flint based. All of the musicians, the production oh. team that I'm putting together, the world's greatest music slash the Guardians, my man um, Kevin Jones, uh, my man Johannes Wortham, like uh, my uh, Master Yo, yeah, Master Yo. my man, my man Lil Mikey, who Lil Mikey has. And I don't even, this is crazy because I don't even know Mikey's last name, right? <laughs> I just always called him Little Mikey, but he has such a powerful voice. He plays the guitar. And it's like all of these musicians and talented people are from Flint, Michigan. So by launching this company, I just want to show the crib that we have artists that we can be proud of, that we can make high level music, high quality mm -hmm. music, and that we also can show like, you know, when black folks get together, it ain't all about negativity or drama. When we put our thoughts and our minds and our brains together, what we do, we are creators. Mm -hmm. So when you have a bunch of us coming together, we're going to create something so powerful and so beautiful. So we just making music that the world can rock to. And we just want to be an example of something positive coming from a situation that the world perceives as negative. Dope. Like that right there is Dope. like people don't understand one thing about Flint and Flint people. Flint is so resilient. Facts. You know what I'm saying? Like Flint was supposed to go under when GM left. You feel supposed what I'm saying? To. Like, we were supposed to go under. Supposed we to. supposed to, you know, all the violence and all, you know, we supposed, supposed to been, to. like, became a ghost town or, supposed you know, to. just kind of faded into obscurity. And we just keep coming back. We, you know what I'm saying? Like, we don't care what's popping off. We gonna be there. And everywhere you go, and I don't know if you had the same experiences, but everywhere I go, even when I was in Puerto Rico, I met somebody from the crib. Mm. Like I've always come across people from the crib. Always Facts. end up coming across somebody from Flint. And even if it's not Flint, it's like Clio, Flushing. And they want to claim Flint when they not in Flint. You know what I'm saying? When they away from the crib, they be like, oh, you're from Flint? Like, I'm from Cairo. And I'll be like, that is not anywhere near <laughs> Flint. They be like, yeah, I'm from around there. No, you no, you're not. not. But no, you're absolutely correct, man. If it's one redeeming quality... If it's one quality that all Flint people have is that resilience. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at, like, even if you take it back to when Mo Cleaves and the Flintstones won the national championship, I don't know if people remember, but Mo Cleaves had, like, broke his ankle and came yeah. back on the court for them to win. Yeah. If you look at Clarissa Shields and her circumstances, she didn't win one gold medal. She won two, then went to, like, it's like... If you from Flint, you over excel. Like, you know what I'm saying? I look at Anthony Durrell, my bro, who just won the WBC championship again. He beat cancer, then won the championship yeah. twice. This is like crazy circumstances. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So if you put a Flint person in any circumstances where we're not supposed to win, not only are we going to win, we're going to exceed the expectations of what you thought winning was. And one thing that I love about all the people that you mentioned um and you know yourself included and just other flint artists to me it seems like they always steal flint fact you know what i'm saying and like even don't let always... me forget too and terry cruz yeah like, you know what i'm saying like i have to because the man the narrative before i met terry cruz was a lot of people would say oh he don't rep flint i'm i'm waiting for somebody to show me where He's been asked that where he's from, and he didn't say Flint. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Every time, he he never shies away from that. 
ever. Like, ever. you know what I'm saying? And, and then my, he came back to Flint and did some, you know, absolutely. he did some 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 stuff in Flint. Was that last year, year before at the Boys and Girls Club? Absolutely. Like, he came and he, I think that people are so used to when people do something for people, they parade it. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like, if you don't have a, a big, you know, to do about it, you didn't do nothing for nobody. Mm-hmm. And I think that sometimes, you know, with, with um even with bigger name people like Jay-Z and, you know, people will be like, oh, he don't do nothing. He don't look out for the hood and this, this, this. And then you have people like Meek Mills and you have people like um, Lil Wayne coming out telling how he paid stuff for them. You know, and he don't look for no recognition for certain things. And I think that throws people off. So, yeah, big shout out to Terry Crews. Cause, big you know, shouts to Terry Crews. Big shouts. Like. I, I, I and I, I'm the reason why I'm overdoing it right now is because like I'm like damn I can't believe I almost forgot T he's so Flint when I did the for the love of money record on Dre's album right uh-huh. he hit me like you know what I'm saying because I said uh uh Flint nigga in the spot till they pop one and the cops come right uh-huh. so he, he sent me a message on my Twitter like yo you said Flint you from Flint <laughs> gave me his address we kicked it. Oh, like the whole week, and not and to this day you see his picture up there it's like that's my dog that's like you know dope. what I'm saying and yeah. that started a relationship that we still have to this day but I'm talking about to me that's what big homies is supposed to do that's what we supposed to do as Flint people I don't I don't ever hate on anybody's success like I love Clarissa me and her have a relationship mm-hmm. I love Anthony Durrell Andre Durrell I love T Cruz I love is it's like anybody from the crib that's getting it I love that you know what I'm saying? Because the way that I got on was somebody that didn't know me helped me. Like, you know what I'm saying? And all of the big homies that I ever met, like I said, even the T. Cruz, he didn't know me. Right. And then he was like, yo, whatever you need me to do, I'll do it. If Whatever you need me to show up for. And every time I ever called, he did it. And it's just like, just because you from the crib. Just because you from Flint. And so I want to be that for the next generation. But I think... Like you said earlier about people's perception of Mateen, I think sometimes I get stigmatized with that as well, that, oh, he probably this, he probably that. I'm probably nothing like what you think I'm probably like. I'm going to tell you what people think. People think that you... <laughs> Please tell me. Let me give you Because I don't know. On the street. I've heard, like, I've heard people say they thought you were stuck up. Mm-hmm. Um, I've heard people feel like you was standoffish mm-hmm. I've heard people feel like you was better than them now mm-hmm. let me say this mm-hmm. these are all people who had never met you or had mm-hmm. a conversation with you so mm-hmm. think about now let's apply logic to that right if they yeah. never met me how could they form that opinion exactly but they you know they have it and not only do they have it but they're sharing it with people because I you know what I'm saying and it, until like you know not too long ago we only really knew each other in passing it was you know I sent you at the camps I you know sent you at shows and stuff like that I'd never got any bad vibes from you so if I ever heard something contrary to what I experienced I'd be like hey you know he not like that woo 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 same with you know other people I always try to give if I know somebody or have come across them and haven't experienced what people are, you know, putting out there is the rhetoric about that person. I always try to be like, hey, uh, that person ain't like that. Or, you know, because I've always got, well, I thought you was mean. And I'll be like, me? Like, mm-hmm. me mean? Like, I can be, but I'm not, you know, I'm not really that person. So, um, so yeah, you know, we get these misconceptions that people have about us. Well, just for the record, all I've ever wanted to do was help people in general and especially people from the crib. Y'all hear that? And the thing mm-hmm. and the thing is and the thing is I can't compete with someone's internal perception. You I can only that. be who I am. Yes. Like you know what I'm saying? And whatever that roadblock is within people that stops them from coming mm-hmm. and saying what's up, I can't help if you saying fuck me under your breath and we right. never met. So, you know what I'm saying? It's impossible. I can't. And you can't really, you know, worry about who you intimidating just by your personality. You got the mic turned towards Shay, man. Yeah, I'm glad you didn't. You were say something. No, I, I was I just going. No, I don't. Come to Back 40 Records, where <laughs> you too can be told how to do your job by the nigga doing his job. <laughs> Like, the thing is, what's funny is, like, i never been, like, a club person. Right. Right. Never at any point in my life. Not in high school. Now, I mean, I used to go to teen parties when I was a kid, right? Yeah. But I've never been a club. I've always been in the studio, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like, 
I've always been kind of an introverted person when it comes to things like that. So it's like, I'm not out for people to know how I am because right. I never go nowhere. Like, you know what I'm saying? If I'm guilty of anything, it's not being accessible enough for people to form a legitimate opinion because I never went nowhere. But do you have to? That's the one thing, like, as an artist, do you know, you make that balance. Like, if you look at somebody like Sade, she's not accessible right. to anybody. Ever. She do what she do, and she go on her little property, and she live her life. You know what I'm saying? You don't owe anybody anything. And that's what y'all fans need to understand. The artists don't owe you anything but their art. And you know what? The thing is, also, and like I said, I'm sure y'all... And we don't owe y'all that. Y'all get... <laughs> we don't owe you that. My <laughs> thing is, in Atlanta, they celebrate outcasts. Yeah. In Chicago, they celebrate Kanye, Common, Twister. Lupe. In Shout LA, they celebrate Dr. Dre, Ice yeah. Cube, NWA, right? All these places in St. Louis, they celebrate Nelly. Yes. In Texas, they celebrate UGK. I feel like, and I'm not even gonna start with me, man, what Anthony Durrell just did, that's history. Mm -hmm. It should be people at Bishop Airport waiting for him to get off, throwing up celebration some type of party something mm -hmm. what Clarissa Shields did ain't normal to go win at the Olympics twice yeah then go unify titles yeah where's the parade right where's the where where is that at do the people know that Darrell just done that though but see that's the thing why yeah, why, why we don't, why know don't that? we it now, was wait who, you know, does, who does that fall on if we don't know that this man just won that again, mm. who, who does that? But see, okay, so my my I guess my answer huh? to that, my answer to that, I got an answer to that. <laughs> it's like, what more can he do? It's on his social media. Right. He, I saw him post it. He posted it. Uh, I seen ABC 12 had that on the news. Like, it's like, I feel like for Flint, I feel like sometimes, and I'm a Flint person yeah. too, I feel like we, we get so stuck on um, sometimes, well, shit, I could do that too if I wanted to. Yeah. That we sometimes don't give people their roses while they can smell them. And I think along with that too is um, sometimes Flint, and I've seen it happen as an artist, will value things outside of Flint mm -hmm. greater than they will value within Absolutely. Flint. I've had events, I had an event at the University of Flint. <laughs> At the University of Michigan, Flint. I'm sorry, um, and you know it. It like let me see something. Like it was me and about ten other artists. You know, poets. They hit me up, asked me to perform for less than I normally perform for. It's in Flint. It's right down the street. I'm gonna go make this little couple. You know what I'm saying? Couple books. Okay, I ain't gotta do much. I take my kids. I don't even need no babysitter. Day before the event, they hit all of us up. After you already can't pay me what you was, you know, what my going rate is, you hit me up and you're going to bring in another artist. Now, I know the other artist. She's a dope artist, everything. You know, big name. She's not from Flint. She's from Detroit. But I know her going rate is 5 G's. You know what I'm saying? Just to get her even in Michigan. You know what I'm saying? Like, if she's in Michigan, like, that's her going rate. Y'all wasn't even finna pay. Y'all was finna pay us about 100 each you know what i'm saying that's way lower than what i normally take but it was a you know it was an event you know at the crib so i try to always and i think that sometimes for flint artists and flint athletes and that's what gives us that distaste in our mouth that's what makes us feel like i need to go to cali or i need to go to atlanta or i need to go wherever i need to go where somebody's going to value mm -hmm. what i do enough to not try to get a discount mm -hmm. They gonna value what I do enough and value my track record. Cause it ain't like we ain't got the track records. A lot of us artists from Flint, you know what I'm saying? A lot of us then went other places and got our due, got what we deserved, got what we asked for with no questions asked. More than what we asked for. And then we come to the crib and that be the slap in the face right there. The slap in the face is like, y'all don't want to pay $10 to come to an event. You know what I'm saying? And then y'all say it's nothing to do. Like that, I think is the frustration for Flint artists right there. Absolutely, that I, we hand in hand on that. That we have to start celebrating and uplifting each other. Yeah. Like you know what I'm saying? Like that thing, like that part. Like there is a culture here in Flint. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? It's just we have to take pride in celebrating that. You know what I'm saying? Like there, I I don't I don't know where that comes from, but I feel like you know. 
I try not to get stuck on problems and just try to be a part of the solution. And so that's why I really wanted to say that like on camera that I uh -huh. just wish that we all would celebrate each other. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. We all give like, like I said, everybody part of my company is from Flint, from the crib. Like, you know what I'm saying? Even us doing this right now, man, what? I, we ain't got to talk no money. Yeah. Just love. We at the crib. Yeah. So for me, it's just like, just echoing what you said. I just wish that, and I want to be a part of a change that sparks all of us into celebrating our own culture and being yeah, proud to be us. Definitely. Um, I think I'm going to do like two more questions and then we're going to be done. Absolutely. So um. So, if you could tell the world about, like, the value of Flint, like, from an artistic standpoint. Mm -hmm. Wow. If I had to explain Flint music to someone who wasn't from here, where would I tell them to start at in understanding Flint music? I would say for me, for me, because of, you got to think, like I say, the time that I grew up in. Right. It would definitely start with Ain't No Future in Your Front, and it would start with Flint Town by the Dayton family. Hey. Is where I would start. You know Flint what I'm saying? Flint Town, Flint Town, Flint Town. Flint Town. You know what I mean? So, because that would, that's us. That's, we from a little bitty city, but as little as we are, we are proud to be from here. Just and, you know what I'm saying? And the things that, we, man, we learn here in Flint how to deal with things that would make other people in other states and cities crumble. So it's like, I feel like those songs like were the first time I heard that in a record of somebody being so proud to be from Flint and taking whatever negativity that they went through, putting it in music form and letting the world feel it. So I would say what we talked about earlier and I quote, uh, Five Heartbeats when uh, Robert Townsend <laughs> said, Donald Matthews is going to be a great writer one day when he suffers more, right? Yep. And then he said, I'm on my way to becoming a great writer, right? Yep. Implying that he has suffered enough to where he had reached greatness. Man, hey. uh, Kyle Kuzma on the basketball court. Why is hey. he so amazing? Because he was born around this. Uh, Mateen Cleaves and, and Charlie Bell, then why do they play like that? Because they was born here. Like, you know what I'm saying? Why do Clarissa Shields look like she ready to just beat up everybody in the room because she was born here? It's just something in her that's naturally embedded in Flint people. Like, um, like I said, even with me and my music and my voice, and a lot of people say, when they meet me, uh, you don't act like what I thought you would <laughs> when I hear you rap, right? But there's something that comes out of me. That's the Flint. That's just Flint. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> It's, it's, a, uh, it's a struggle that we all born so naturally with here that's natural and normal to us, but to the rest of the world, they don't have that. And I embrace that and I love that. And I think that that's what comes out in Flint music is that what y'all look at as terrible circumstances, we took that, we ate that, we made it into something great and we gave it back to y'all. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, just touching on what you said, I think that the reason that like those people are so dope and stuff because and what people don't realize on the outside looking in there was somebody better than them mm -hmm. that did not make Facts. it there was Facts. niggas out there on the court eating them alive that ended up Facts. dead and in jail may i also say there were definitely hella rappers that was better than me that i felt like yeah. was better than me like you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. like that's a it's a phrase that uh where people say um, it's a cat in the hood that was better than Jordan, you know what I'm saying? Right. But we don't know who he is, right? Yeah. But it's like, I I definitely felt like that, that the competition and everybody wanted it so bad that it makes you better. Yep, definitely. And Bella Sunshine just walked in, ladies and gentlemen. Up, Bella hey, Bella, how you doing? I mean, you know, we did put, um, you know, Mr. Ricky <laughs> over here on the spot. Uh, So, you know, can you sing something for us real quick? You can't throw nothing out there for us. <laughs> okay, can you tell us a little bit about your project? Yeah, just just show, throw done. something just, out there. Shout something out. I just Don't got be trying to act shy. Album. What they know so far is the album is called The Experience. I said that you uh, was influenced by Brandy and uh, Monica and stuff like that. And that, that's what I said, but you can say it better than me. So. Yes, well, first off, 
I I am so shy on the spot. Like I, have, I just I just I don't like I don't know. Well, I'm gonna put you on the spot every time. <laughs> but yeah, I was influenced by Brandy, uh, Monica, Aaliyah, Felicia. You no, know, those people I grew up under. And so, what's the experience? Why the name the experience? Because you get to experience different stages of who I am or how I'm feeling. Dope, dope. I was telling before you got here, like, I knew her all this time, and I didn't even know she was an artist. <laughs> so, yes, we will definitely get to experience. So, thank you, Miss Shy, Bella Sunshine, thank for, you know, <laughs> the sunshine cannot be shy. You got to go ahead and just shine, Bella. I'm in shine. Oh, Bella is asleep right now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so my last question, uh, and then I will let you go oh, and yes. stop, you know, your pestering you. Yes, because I'm getting the, like, roll it finger over here. The, in a minute, the you know, the music is going to come on like the award shows, right. and we're going to get drowned out. Um, oh, and you smell good. What is that you got on, girl? Uh, Did you get that from the oil shop? <laughs> the oil shop, Flint, 5014 North Saginaw Street. Come down and get all of your oil needs. <laughs> the plug was so <laughs> crucial. <laughs> <laughs> oh, pink sugar. That's one of the ones right there. I like that. Um, and we do carry pink sugar down at the oil shop so y'all can come and hide. I definitely got to make my way to the oil shop. I do. Don't forget the peppermint soap. So, ladies, let me just throw That's this in here. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I was finna do a commercial, but it tingles. It tingles. Um, okay, so. I got to eat. Yawn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, Amber. So, if you could just give the world, like all these people who got these misconceptions and all this kind of stuff, tell them who the fuck John Connor is. Um, Can y'all quit whispering over here? <laughs> Me and Jan are finishing up. <laughs> <laughs> that this is, is a real interview. That is awesome how you just said my name. I like you know what I'm saying? The government name. Yes. <laughs> love it. Um... Just to, uh, who is who is? Did you say Jan or John Connor? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm gonna ask because we don't need to let them know who Jan is because uh, Jan might be a little complex for the people. Okay. So, mm -hmm. who is John Connor, and what can they expect from you every time? If they can't expect nothing else, what the hell can they expect from you? Um, honesty, you know, honesty, passion, um, my all, every time. Whether it's on stage, whether uh, whether it's on the microphone, no matter what it is, you're going to get... Um, I, I've always felt like John Connor is just the vehicle in which Jan expresses himself. Dope. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So all John Connor is is me saying the things that... It's kind of like, a, and we're going to wrap it up like this. I have to mention Batman. This is a John Connor interview, and I ain't mentioned Batman one time. And I was going to ask you uh -huh. just to tell the people about how John Connor became your moniker. Um, if if we could see the room, we would see the influences of comic books and things like that. So please slide it in there. Because there are some people who, does not, who do not understand where the John Connor, how that ties in. Some people are so lost, like, oh, I thought his name was John Connor, not knowing where John Connor originated. It. So, okay, so and then boom, we wrapping it up. Yep. I promise. Okay, I'm just, looking out for I'm, you. It's all, it's all good. <laughs> we'll be here all night. I'll be like, so, do your mama make grits <laughs> in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> do your mama make grits in the morning? Your mama right? born, no, so. Cause we gonna be here all night. <laughs> okay, so, well, uh, the John Connor thing, and uh, like I said, I'll, I'll put all of this in one answer. But um, it kind of to me was like, uh, I always been a Batman fan, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought that was cool, just the story of uh, this cat, Bruce Wayne, right? So he adapts this persona to do the right thing, right? Because as this billionaire, people, you know, it's only so much he could do. I could donate the foundations and this and that, but really I need to get down and dirty and I got to get in the streets and really do something, right? Yeah. I always felt like as Jan Freeman, the person, right? I could say, I could have, I could have the most intelligent conversation ever in a room full of like 10 people, but everybody will leave and be like, oh, Jan, just be talking. But if I make a song about it as John Connor and I can make it, if I can make positivity sound good, mm -hmm. and if I can make the repetition of me helping people sound good over and over, then that's me putting on that mask. That's John Connor putting on that, that, that persona to where now I'm really helping people. You know, one person at a time as Jan Freeman is just like a, 
a little sprinkler, right? Mm -hmm. Like of water and seeds. But as John Connor and through the music, it's like a fire hose and I'm spraying positivity right. over the masses all at one time. And that came and that whole persona shit came from one night, 18 years old, I'm watching the Terminator movies back to back. And the, the weight of that character, John Connor, um, that if he died or if something happened to him, then the world was just fucked over. Right. And I said to myself, I want my music and my existence to be that heavy on the world. I want to be the John Connor of music. And then I said, you know what? There it is. I'm John Connor. And I do have one more question. My manager's gonna kill me because, but they just keep coming. I'm sorry. Um, um, so yeah. with you, you know, you did the, the Batman comparison. Yeah. So you know, my favorite superhero. So do you Bam, do right you there. feel like Batman is a superhero, or do you feel like he's an anti-hero? To where even though he's doing he has the goal of good sometimes you have to do bad to get that good Do, is that um part of the allure of batman for you that he's not necessarily a superhero he's kind of like an anti-hero to where i'm not trying to act like i'm perfect and i'm not trying to you know walk around you know i'm not trying to put that persona out there i'm I fuck shit up because if you look at it, I, I saw this wonderful analysis um, mm -hmm. in somebody's blog where they talked about how Joker was technically like a anti-hero and they kind of played it as Batman being the villain. You know what I'm saying? Like Joker at the end of the day was really trying to blah, blah, blah. It was it was dope. It's just Side dope. note, and I want you to keep asking that question, but if you watch The Dark Knight, do you realize the Joker really won? Yeah, that's yeah. what they, and that's in what they was, yeah. Like, and that's where they did it. They did it after the Dark Knight. They even down to the point, and like I say, all this I know can get edited mm -hmm. out. We good, right? Yeah. Even down to the point when when they was in the interrogation room and the mm -hmm. Joker said, "Tonight you are gonna have to break your one rule to understand that the only way to live is without rules." Yep. And he did, cause technically he killed Harvey Dent yeah. to save Commissioner Gordon's son. Yeah. It was like everything the Joker said was gonna happen happened in the movie. And like which is this crazy. is totally off the off record. But off. you know, like it was like the Joker was almost like, nigga, oh you think you too good? You think you don't have to get down and dirty, nigga? I thought just like you at one point. Let me let you let Agreed. me let you see what it is. But here's the thing. Okay. And now we going back. Now see yep. why this press training, I'm reeling <laughs> it back into your original question. Cool. Batman is definitely the ultimate anti hero though. You know what I'm saying? Because he's doing something technically that by the rules of society is wrong, but he's doing it for the right reasons because he feel like the level y'all going to take it to ain't enough to do, ain't enough to fix nothing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I got to go all out. It's kind of how I feel. It's like uh, it is how I feel about the John Connor thing that if I made a certain genre of music, right? Like, because I think that the masses feel like um, if, it, if it's not maybe, I don't know, um, we'll just take like gospel music, right? Mm -hmm. P a lot of people feel like if, if you're not making gospel music, then you're not helping people or it's just bad or it's evil, right? Mm -hmm. But I feel like the people that I'm trying to reach I probably got to say motherfucker to really reach them. My favorite Lauryn Hill quote, even after all my logic and, and my, my theory, theory, I add a motherfucker, motherfucker so these ignorant, ignorant niggas hear me. me. Right? Like, that's it right there. I got to. I got to be Batman. I got to do shit that y'all can't do. Right. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I have to talk in ways that y'all y'all ain't trying to, you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I do feel like that. And I do feel like in that way, my John Connor persona is that. That it is my anti-hero that is i'm trying i'm gonna do what's necessary to be done to help the best way that i know how and the joker was definitely the villain shay <laughs> joker <laughs> is a very complex individual oh. it's the balance goddammit. it and the joker you know he my mic. Oh. The Joker. <laughs> right. The so, okay. John, We're John I would like to say thank you uh -huh. so much for this interview. I would like to say thank you for everyone else who participated. Y'all go ahead and make some noise. Hey. Sunshine, Ricky Calloway, thank you.
Loveland. This is how we get down. This is Loveland Studios that y'all are seeing right now. This place has such a dope energy. Um, John, I just want to thank you for opening up your studios to us, for um, collaborating with me and Fire um, and the Sister Tour, <laughs> yeah. and for just being such <laughs> funny as hell. <laughs> I ain't fooling with him. <laughs> for being such a genuine individual and for keeping it real and always repping Flint and for you know what I'm saying. No. <laughs> Hey, Pat, welcome back. to Black. We back there hating on me so crazy. Back forty records. So crazy. Welcome to Back Forty Records. Back, where? Back, back forty. Where? But no, thank y'all. Shug Ock. I will. Want, no, I want to say too. No, thank y'all for real for doing this. And yeah, I, yeah. I really. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't nobody fucking with him. I'm saying man. no. I appreciate. I really do appreciate this. Because a lot of times you don't get to do interviews where it's this relaxed, this comfortable, or where somebody cares enough about the questions that they're asking you for you to get a genuine answer. A lot of times yeah. artists have ready set answers that they pre prepared because they know that this person across from them is just doing their job. So I really appreciate the genuine energy. For well, us. you guys will never be able to guess what the loudmouth ghetto girl is going to ask. So, um, last question Do you have any illegitimate children? No, 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 I don't. Oh my God. No, so, if you no. guys have any questions that you would like to ask John, where can they find you? Social media, all that good stuff. Throw that out there. At John Connor Music, I believe, is everything. That's and my Twitter, Instagram. That will Instagram, be coming across the screen in this area once that we get everything edited it will come across the screen john connor please spell it for people because people J really don't J -O <laughs> J <laughs> this no. is crazy she was just like climbing in front of the camera <laughs> did you just get in front of the camera what you talking about what you talking about willis you know how much my film costs <laughs> huh? so anyway it's j-o-n-c-o-n-n-o-r uh, but Come thank you so much you again. We cannot wait for the new music when you get it. If we can get some exclusive shit that we can play, we would love to have it just gotcha. dribbling in the background we while we gotcha. interview gotcha. people. Gotcha. Gotcha. I mean, today, but, you know. Can we come back and we'll do another? Absolutely. Like after like release or oh, yeah. Absolutely. We would love to do like an exclusive when you're about to release. And, like, even, like, Bella, like, have, like, Ricky, Ali, we would Bella, love to get y'all on the, the show. The, you know the, what I'm the, saying? The have those ladies. So, <laughs> we get a chance to talk to those ladies. So, that are part absolutely. Of the it world. seems like it has went left now. So, I'm going to Well, yeah, that would. That would. That would be really cool. Yeah. Like, look, I'm I'm putting y'all on the spot right now, though. I'm putting you on the spot. Okay, John is putting us on the spot right now. I'm putting I'm putting you on the spot, right? Yep. So there are three women. Well, actually, it's four women in AVM Music Group, right? But one of yes. them live in California. But there's Jada Ali. Can we Ali. get her on the phone? Yeah, we could. But no. you got Jada Ali, Bella Sunshine, and Marie Mills, I would right? love to do like a roundtable discussion with them where we talked about shit that really ain't got nothing it's to do with music. There, That's darling. awesome. That's yep. awesome. We're going to be talking about niggas that... We're going to talk about niggas that throw off your pH she's balance not and all kinds of stuff. anymore. So... <laughs> The be it's ready. The it's she be ready. My pH balance has been good for years. Oh, <laughs> thank you guys. It has been an amazing <laughs> interview. I'm John Connor. Loudmouth ghetto girl. Loudmouth ghetto. Loudmouth ghetto girl. Loudmouth ghetto girl. We might just get hit with the Rico. That's how they get on my people. They take somebody like Huey and they make them see